Okay, I should put the first slide first. All right. Okay. Uh, so thanks. So thanks, uh, Benny, Kamit, and uh, and uh, Nier and Zika for for inviting me to to talk in the school. So it's it's been a lot of fun so far. I hope it continues. So I'm going to give three lectures. The three lectures are all on the same uh, topic, which is the question of how do you delegate a quantum computation. Um, so let me start by uh, the problem statement. Oh, before I start, remind you, Nier said it. I think uh, you can ask questions in the Slack, and the moderators will forward the questions to me. So feel free to to interrupt at any time, especially if there's confusion on the notation or or anything like that. Um, let me tell you about the problem that we're going to be thinking about. So in this problem, we have uh, two parties. The first party is what I'll sometimes call uh, the client or the verifier. And this is a trusted entity. So it does exactly what we ask it uh, to do. And then uh, this trusted entity gets to act, gets to interact with another, uh, which I will call the server or the prover. And that one is untrusted. So there might be some actions that it's supposed to perform, but in reality, it does uh, whatever it wants. So now uh, this client uh, receives as input a classical description of a quantum circuit, C. So this classical description is just a list of uh, gates uh, that, the, that, that compose the, the circuit. And then an input to the circuit, I'll call that input uh, X. And their goal is to determine what the circuit returns on the input X. You can imagine circuits returning all kinds of things, but for simplicity in these lectures, I'll consider only circuits that return just a single bit. So we imagine that the circuit has a designated output qubit, and at the end of the computation, the output qubit is supposed to be measured, and the question is, what is that result? So the verifier might not be able to do the computation by themselves. Uh, for example, they might not even have a, a quantum computer. Um, they're just getting all this information classically. So in order to determine uh, the outcome of the computation, they'll interact the server through maybe one round, maybe more rounds of communication. And at the end of the interaction, their goal is to return two things. Uh, the first thing is a flag. And this flag denotes whether um, the verifier accepts or rejects the computation. And then the second thing is a candidate value B for the outcome of the computation. Now here are um, first informally are the kind of properties that we um, want to hold of such an interaction. The first maybe most important property is uh, called verifiability. And this is informally, it's just the idea that uh, whatever the server does, either the verifier um, is going to reject uh, or if they accept, then they'll return the correct outcome for the computation. So one way to write it would be to say that you know, there should be a quantifier for every server, the probability that the flag is equal to accept and the outcome B is different from the correct output of the circuit on input X, this should be negligible. Okay. So this expression is, uh, is a little bit um, informal. In particular, when I write B different from C of X, then what is C of X? So again, for simplicity, I'm going to imagine that my all circuits that are considered have uh, a clear output, meaning that the circuit returns zero or one at the end, and it either returns zero with probability pretty close to one, let's say at least three quarters, or one with probability at least three quarters. Okay, there's always a dominant outcome, and this is what I call C of X. Okay. Um, we can generalize the problem, for example, to testing testing um, sampling problems. So a more stringent condition would be, oh, I want that conditioned on the flag being accept, the distribution of the bit B returned by the verifier should be almost identical to the distribution of the output of this circuit. Okay, it's something that we could look into, that people look into, but I'm not I'm not going to talk too much about that for the for the lecture. So that's the first uh, main property. Second property that's uh, oops. Studied in the quantum setting is called uh, blindness. This is the idea, it's, it's like privacy. Uh, it's the idea that the server learns nothing. And I'll say it informally now and we'll make it formal later. So server learns nothing about the computation. Okay, so if I just put these two properties here, there's um, like trivial ways that they could be achieved. For example, if the client has a quantum computer, they just do everything by themselves and uh, this would be verifiable and, and blind. So another thing that we're interested in is uh, efficiency. And there's two forms of efficiency. First, 
there's efficiency for the verifier, I guess this is the most uh, important thing, then their computation time should be much less than, let's say, just the size of the circuit. And again, I'm writing this informally. In particular, in the quantum case, uh, there's a distinction that we make between classical computations and quantum computations. So a model that we look into is one where the verifier might require classical computation time. That's kind of the same as the size of the circuit, but quantum computational time zero, or maybe something very small compared to the size of the circuit. And then somewhat less important from a theoretical point of view, but important from a practical point of view would be uh, to limit the overhead at the prover's side. So intuitively it's clear that if we want to solve this problem, the computation time of at least one of these two entities is going to have to scale uh, with the size of the circuit, but we don't want it to be too much more. So this time for the server would be you know, about uh, the size of the circuit, not too much overhead to get these verifiability and, uh, and blindness properties. Finally, the last thing is, well, under what kind of assumptions are we going to be able to uh, realize this? And I'll show you different schemes. Some of them will be information theoretically secure. Of course, that's the ideal situation. So information theoretically secure just means that when I talk about the verifiability and blindness properties here, I'd put for every prover, here for every prover, and uh, that's it. There's no restriction on the prover. Then I can also consider schemes uh, that would be only computationally secure. And that means putting a restriction on the prover uh, under which the properties will hold. For example, this prover is uh, restricted to be a quantum polynomial time machine that does not have the ability to break certain uh, post-quantum security assumptions. Okay, so very loosely, that's the problem that we wanna solve. And here's the outline for the, the three lectures. Um, so I'm going to give you three different ways uh, of approaching this problem. The first that we'll see in uh, the first lecture, so now, uh, is uh, going to give us information theoretic delegation with a small quantum verifier. So this uh, verifier will have a polynomial time classical computer and then a constant size or maybe slightly than constant depending on the security parameter, uh, but not on the size of the circuit uh, quantum computer. Then uh, in the second hour, uh, we'll see again information theoretic delegation in a setting where the verifier is completely classical, uh, but gets in to interact with two circuits. And this will involve uh, techniques to manipulate uh, entanglement between, between the servers. And then in the third lecture, uh, we'll see a single prover delegation uh, with a classical verifier under computational uh, assumptions. Okay, so my goal uh, in, in, in these three lectures is to give you kind of a, a sense of uh, the different models, how they work, what's special about them. And not only how do you do, do you do delegation in these models, but also more generally for each model, what's the kind of technique that can be used to uh, model a quantum adversary, manipulate a quantum adversary uh, in different settings. Because I think these things are more broadly useful than the particular setting of delegated computation. I think some of them will probably show up uh, tomorrow also when we talk about uh, two-party or multi-party computation. Okay, so if there is no um, already urgent questions, I'll go ahead, okay, cool. Um, I guess people are waking up, so. I'm also waking up. Okay, so um, the lecture will proceed in two steps. First, I'll talk about blindness and show you how to achieve blindness, which is a little bit easier. And then I'll talk about verifiability and show how to achieve uh, verifiability. So I wanna give you a, a formal definition of um, the blindness property. It's, it's written there on the slide and it's, it's easier to explain uh, in pictures. And uh, let me show you how we can represent one of these interactive quantum interactive protocols. That's a useful thing to know. So um, let me put the, I'll try to put the verifier in green and the prover in blue. I, I think I'm gonna forget. So the verif let's put the verifier here and the prover next to it. So this verifier has an initial state that it controls. This is an initial state has a quantum state in which I write a classical description of the circuit. Then there's a classical description, well, there's the classical input and then there's maybe uh, a bunch of zeros. The provers, on the other hand, on the other hand, could be starting in an arbitrary state that I could stay, call the state of the prover. Now, it's always important, uh, and we saw this in the uh, tutorial on, on quantum key distribution, to remember that uh, quantum states are not necessarily pure. Uh, they can be shared entanglement with some reference system, like the rest of the universe, and it's important to take that into account in any security definition. So, what I just wrote here is not correct. The correct way to write it would be to say that. I should also have a reference. This is just the rest of the universe and the state of the prover is just some arbitrary state that 
uh, might be entangled with the reference. Okay, so it has two red two parts: one part that the prover owns, one part that the reference owns. Okay, and so now how does this protocol proceed? Well, the verifier first does something. So because I added all these zero ancillas, I can imagine that they apply unitary transformation. So let's just call it uh, V1. And then at the end of this unitary transformation, there's parts of the qubits that get sent to the prover and parts of the qubits that stay here. Then the prover is going to apply some transformation. Let me just call it uh, F1 that acts on the message it uh, received and its private state. And then again, it's going to return some qubits to the verifier and keep some to itself. And then maybe to keep it, oops, to keep it simple, uh, let's just consider a protocol that has a single round of interaction. So the prover does another unitary V2, and then out here are going to come some qubits that it traces out. It ignores them, trace out, and some qubit that it keeps that are supposed to contain the outcome. So that's the, the flag, uh, the B, and maybe some other information if it wants to keep some other information for some later, um, later protocols. The reference uh, just does nothing, so it's like this. Okay, so the property of blindness is that uh, the prover should learn no information at all. In order to model that, we consider how this protocol acts on the total input state of the universe. So we consider it starting from all these states there. Then we run the protocol forward and we consider what the output here uh, at the prover and the reference looks like. So this corresponds, what I just um, circled in red is this map here, okay? This corresponds to running the protocol forward and then tracing out the part that the prover uh, keeps. So this is the A system and we, we ignore that, okay? So basically this is when you run the protocol, what information does the prover has? And the security definition says that this as a, as a quantum map, so it's just a map that takes all these input states and returns the output there. It should be indistinguishable from a map that just starts from the prover and the reference does something. So this is what's called F um, in the definition on the prover, nothing on the reference, and that's it. Okay, so it maps states like this to states uh, like that. Okay, so here um, on the left, I'm fixing this state, and then the map is given this state is fixed, all the other unitaries on the picture are fixed. I consider the map that takes uh, the state psi PR to the output here at the prover reference. And this should be indistinguishable from some other map that um, doesn't depend on the verifier's uh, input, okay? So intuitively, um, this will guarantee you blindness. And you can show, even though it's not clear from the picture, that this is the right definition in the sense that it's composable. So if you set things up as uh, it was set in maybe the second or the third um, lecture on, on, on quantum key distribution with uh, an environment and simulators and things like this, and you kind of simplify uh, the definition, then you arrive at the definition that's on, that's on the slide. Maybe something that I want to say, because I think it wasn't part of the crash course, so is I wrote something here that I, that I didn't explain. So what's a CPTP map? CPTP stands for uh, completely positive trace preserving. It's just uh, kind of lingual for the most general quantum transformation. So the most general quantum transformation is uh, unitary, um, but not only. There's two other things you can do. One is you can create fresh qubits to so just add a bunch of zeros. That's not a unitary because it kind of increases the dimension of the space. And the other thing you can do is, is junk qubits, like throw them away. That would reduce the dimension of the space. So general quantum maps are exactly this. They're uh, the combination of adding a few qubits, applying a unitary, and tracing out some qubits. Okay. And so in general, the prover will be modeled in this way. This is what I said. This is what I did uh, here. I allowed them to create as many qubits as they want. And then here implicitly, okay, if the prover wants to trace out things, they can, they can trace them out. Okay, so this was just to give a sense of what's a, a formal definition like. I mean, in, in the lecture, I don't really have time to formally show you that, that things are going to satisfy uh, the definition, but it's, it's now to give you a sense of it. All right. Okay, so let's see how we can create a protocol that just achieves this, this property, blindness. In particular, we'll assume that the prover, the server does what they're asked to do. Uh, the only thing that we're worried about is how much information uh, are, they going to, are they going to get. So this is pretty easy. We'll do it in two steps. The first step, the idea is that I'm just going to use the prover as a giant quantum memory. 
So what I'll do is I'll take my input. So this input was the circuit x zero, and I'm going to hide it using a quantum one-time pad. So I'll take two uh, quantum one-time pad keys, A and B. Let's have them have length M. M is the total length of this verifier's input. And then I'm going to take create a state Psi, which is, I'll write this in shorthand like this, X, A, Z, B, um, circuit X zero, okay? This is shorthand notation for um, in each qubit, if uh, a i is one, I apply an x, and if b i is one, I apply z. If they're zero, I don't, I don't apply it. So I, I think everyone saw the the quantum one-time pad in the in the crash course. Yeah, yeah, Leon is nodding. Okay, so you saw it. Um, it's really a funny thing because it's it's like a classical one-time pad. Classical one-time pad would uh, just apply an, an x, so it would do a random bit flip. You know, either you flip the bit or not, and that completely hides the information. In a quantum case, it's quite amazing that by adding just a, a single other randomizing operation, so phase uh, randomization, this just adds a phase plus one or minus one, depending on the qubit, is enough to completely hide the qubit. It's counterintuitive because you're only using two classical bits of key to hide something that, you know, at some level you might think is, is a continuous degree of freedom, um, but, but of course it, it, it isn't, and, and this works. Okay, so you do this, and then you send the state psi to the prover, and this state prover is going to hold psi as a, using a memory. And then the protocol will proceed as follows. So for each gate G in the circuit, this gate G acts on qubits um, I and J. The verifier is going to request the qubits I and J from the pure prover, I and J. This prover is going to send back some density matrix. So now this is no longer a pure state, pure state. So I'll, I'll write it like this, a two qubit density matrix, which is supposed to be the two qubits that I asked. Then the verifier is going to undo the one-time pad, apply the gate, and apply a fresh one-time pad. This gives it a state whole prime on these two qubits, and it sends it back to the prover. Okay. And then we do this until the end of the circuit. Then we request the output qubit. This output qubit comes. Let's just call it whole one. It's the first term. Output qubit, we undo the one-time pad and then uh, we measure. Okay. So there's some good things and some bad things uh, about this protocol. Um, let's see two good things. First of all, uh, it's not completely obvious the way I described it, but this verifier can get away with a two qubit quantum computer. Uh, the reason is that at the first step here, it doesn't need to create the whole input and then one time pad the whole input and then send it uh, everything together. It could do it uh, just one qubit at a time. In fact, because I'm considering a classical input, this is really a classical string. And on the classical string, the Z does nothing and X just a, does a flip. So even though I wrote this as a quantum state, it's, it's a classical state. So the verifier is just classical at this point. And then for each of the other steps, it only needs to manipulate the two qubits that uh, it receives from the prover, uh, do the Pauli's, apply the gate, and then and then send it back. So let me write it here as a good thing. So verifier needs only a two qubit computer. And the second good property is that uh, it's blind. Okay, so how do we check that this is blind? Well, we have to see what information the prover gets. And the prover gets this state psi, but that's one time padded. So it looks like a uniformly random state. Uh, here, I forgot to say something. So it does get, um, in. this looks like it gets information about the circuit implicitly. So I put the circuit in the input. So I forgot to say that I'm thinking of the verifier as running a universal circuit. So there exists, just like in the classical case, quantum universal circuits. So it's just a quantum circuit of a certain fixed size. And this quantum circuit takes as input the description, the classical description of a quantum circuit and the classical input for it, and it just runs them, okay? So this universal circuit, you only need a bound on the verifier's circuit, an upper bound on the verifier's circuit size uh, in order to determine what it is. And so we can imagine that the verifier and the prover know exactly the circuit that's being computed. So in fact, this, this request um, for qubits i and j that comes from the verifier doesn't even need to be sent uh, because the prover knows this universal circuit and it just, so it just knows what qubits it's supposed to provide. So this is information from the prover to the verifier. And here we have information from the verifier to the prover. 
And uh, this information here, I was careful to apply a fresh one-time pad every time I send a quantum state to the prover. So I don't have to worry about correlations uh, with anything. This always looks like a totally mixed state. There's no information coming. I think it's actually an open question whether this fresh one-time pad uh, is required. You could say, well, why don't you use the same one-time pad keys? Uh, does that allow uh, the prover to cheat? And I, maybe someone will answer this, but I, I think it's not known whether you could do that uh, or not. So these are the good things. The bad thing is that well, I don't know how you feel about this protocol, but I feel like I'm being cheated <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it's like really the verb. I just had, we just had the idea of uh, using the prover as a memory, but the verifier is, is really doing all the work. It's still kind of interesting because it's not something that exists uh, in, the, in, the, in the classical setting. Um, in the classical setting, you could try to do this, but then in the end, if you look at the classical computation of the verifier, it, it's still a really large amount of computation because at, at first it has to create the whole thing and then there's all these rounds of interaction. So the amount of classical work done by the verifier is no smaller than computing the circuit itself. So you wouldn't even want to do this in the classical setting. In the quantum setting, I can distinguish classical and quantum computation. And so I, I still have a non-trivial non protocol. Okay, so let's move forward a little bit. The next step uh, I'm going to do is still focus only on blindness, but try to make the effort of the verifiers smaller. I want to make it now a single qubit computer. And also I just want a memory. So the verifier is not going to apply any get at all, but it's still going to require just a single qubit, okay? That's a little bit more non-trivial. And the idea for achieving this is the idea of uh, computing on encrypted data. Um, and sometimes in, in the context of error correction, it's called uh, transversal gates. So I think we might not have seen the definition or of uh, a Clifford gate. So uh, we have the Paulis, um, and maybe I should have reminded you just in case that the Paulis, so there's uh, X, there's Z, and these are just elementary uh, unitary transformations. And then there's Y, which is I, X, Z. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, kind of quantum gates. Then one level up is what we call Clifford gates. So the definition of Clifford gates is that they conjugate Pauli's to themselves. So here's one way to write it. If you apply any Pauli followed by a Clifford gate, you can exchange the order. You keep the same Clifford gate and there's another Pauli there. Okay, so I could move the Clifford uh, to the left and I would be saying that Clifford's conjugate uh, Pauli's to Pauli's. So examples are uh, all Pauli's. Another example is the Hadamard. Uh, why? Because if I apply a Hadamard, I conjugate an X by a Hadamard. Hadamard is a matrix that exchanges the computational and the um, Hadamard basis. So it does this and it does that. Okay, so it maps Pauli's to Pauli's with Y, I would have something similar. Another example is the C naught uh, gate. So that's just a controlled, classical controlled knot. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so Clifford's are generated by uh, X, Y, Z, Hadamard, uh, C naught. No, I think maybe I need to add phase. Phase is a uh, square root of Z. So it's one, zero, zero, I. Okay. So Clifford gates are special for multiple reasons. One of the main reasons that they're very special is that any quantum circuit that consists only of Clifford gates can be classically simulated. Um, this is a non-trivial result. There's a, there's a beautiful simulation Okay, that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but it gives the intuition that Clifford gates are not really quantum. Um, they're not classical either because they include the Hadamard, which is clearly a quantum gate, but they're not fully quantum. In order to get a fully universal quantum gate set, you need to take the Clifford gates and you need to add any single qubit gate that's not a Clifford gate. Uh, one example is the, is the T gate here. Um, you can verify that this T gate is not a Clifford gate, but if you add it to the Clifford's, then you get a universal get set. Okay, so the relation that it satisfies is something like um, if you apply it to uh, Pauli's A and B, then you can exchange it. You'll get another Pauli here, but you'll pick up uh, a phase. There's a P that comes in here and then there's a C prime and this C prime is some function of A and B that, that I'm not that I'm not going to, to write on this on the slide. Okay, so for that reason, it's not a Clifford gate. Okay, so how do we use these observations to improve the protocol that we had on the previous slide? Uh, whether there's two observations. The first one is that all Clifford gates, because they commute in a certain way with Pauli's, in particular with the one-time pad, 
these are things that the server can apply itself on the one-time pile. So Clifford Gates can be applied by the server directly. Okay, so when in the protocol before we had a situation where the server has some state, let me write it as a pure state just for simplicity. So this is the server, this is the verifier. And let's say I wanted to apply a Hadamard gate. So the server holds a one-time padded uh, encryption of Psi and the verifier holds the key A and B. Well, the server can directly apply the Hadamard. This Hadamard is gonna exchange things. So what's gonna happen is that if I apply Hadamard on the outside, I can commute it with the X and the Z. I need, just need to exchange X and Z. So this is gonna become Z A X B H Psi, which is equal to um, X B Z A H Psi and um, X and Z anti-commute. So I'll pick up a phase uh, like this. And so the verifier knows what's going on. And so they can just exchange their keys. They know that, okay, before um, the X key was A, the Z key was B. And now that I the server applied the Hadamard, the X key has become B and the Z key has become an A. So I just exchanged these two things and my new keys are like this, okay? So this didn't require any communication at all. The server just applies the circuit directly on the one-time padded state. The verifier knows that the circuit is doing this and they just update their keys as the computation goes. Okay, we can do this for any Clifford gates, no communication, which is uh, cruise through. Uh, the only issue is when we arrive at a non-Clifford gate. Uh, and so we can assume that this non-Clifford gate is just the T gate. Um, and here's the idea that, that appears in the paper by Childs on how we're going to apply uh, T gate. It's, it's kind of cute. So let me write it here at the bottom of the slide. So I have a verifier, I have a server, same setup as before, except that now it wants to apply a T gate. So we can apply a T gate. Uh, but using the relation that I wrote earlier, what's going to happen is that the state is going to be T gets applied. That's good. The keys are updated to some A prime and B prime that can be inferred from A and B. That's good too. But now I picked up this phase gate um, with some exponent C prime, which could be zero or one. And so we want to say if it's zero, it's, it's okay. Um, but if it's one, uh, then we kind of have a problem. And this problem gets worse and worse as you continue. You could say, well, fine, like let's use A prime, B prime, C prime as my keys and, and continue. The problem is that next time I apply a T gate on top of this, it's gonna get worse, like some other gate, then the P is going to come out and it just gets a huge mess that we, don't, uh, we can't keep track of. In fact, it's, you, you couldn't. Uh, so we need to do something to take it out. And the idea to take it out is that the verifier is gonna request the qubit. So the server is gonna send that qubit, let's call it ho, to the verifier. And then the verifier is going to do two different things depending whether C prime is zero or one. So if C prime is equal to one, it's going to send the same qubit back to the server. The server is going to apply P, send it back to the verifier, and the verifier is sending, going to send it back again. Each time a qubit goes through the verifier, um, it applies new one-time pad keys. Okay, this is why I sent it back and sent it back. And, okay, sorry, I'm out of space. Uh, if C prime is zero, so nothing needs to be applied, then in this case, what's gonna happen is that the verifier got the whole as before, but now it's going to send back, not the state itself, but some dummy state. This is just a one-time padded dummy state, anything. The server is gonna do the same thing because they're not told what is C prime. So they're gonna apply a phase to the P. The dummy is gonna come back and then the verifier is gonna send back the actual state uh, to the server, okay? The result of this interaction is that the server always does the same thing. Um, they send a qubit, they expect a new one-time padded qubit, they apply the phase gate on it, send it back, expect something at the end, and then they'll continue the computation from there. If C prime was zero, they do exactly the same thing. So they learn no information at all about C prime. This is important because C prime is related to the one-time pad keys, and we don't want to leak information about these one-time pad keys uh, to the server. Okay, and that's it. So the protocol is very simple. Uh, Clifford gates the verifier just runs the computation directly by themselves. And the only thing non-trivial is when the T-gate happens, the server applies it, but then there's this four message interaction with the verifier that ensures that the uh, this called phase correction uh, gets, gets removed from the, from the computation. So now uh, the verifier only needs, uh, as promised, a, a single qubit uh, quantum memory. They never applied any gates. They had to apply the, the one-time path at the, at the start but this was classical computation. And now at each step, 
um, Clifford's, they don't do anything. And so only the T gate and the T gate is, is a one qubit gate. So you only need to have a one qubit memory uh, here or, or there. Okay. So as we're going to see later, uh, getting rid of this, this one qubit is a significant challenge. And I'll talk about that in, in the lectures uh, two and three. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention maybe is, um, okay, let me, let me not mention it. Uh, let me continue with, okay, are there questions about this? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to get uh, verifiability in these protocols now, in addition to blindness. So is there any question? Um, there's a question about the fresh uh, one to one time pad and child's protocol. It's a bit okay. long, but I can read it. Um, it says, I'm not sure whether you can use the exact um, the same quantum one time pad, but it seems that you don't need fresh randomness. For example, after a Hadamard gate, um, if you encrypt it with the updated keys, then it should be fine. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good comment. And this is apparent in, in the protocol I just described now where um, any Clifford gates, actually the qubits don't go through the verifier at all. So the one-time pad doesn't get, uh, doesn't get updated. And so we could have done that in the, in the protocol before. So the question would be only in, uh, in this T gate here, uh, whether and how much I need to, to introduce a, a fresh one-time pad. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's talk about verifiability now. Um, I put on the slide a definition that's a little bit similar to the definition that I gave you for delegation. And let me also explain it. It's, it's, it looks slightly more complicated, but it's, um, it has a similar spirit. So let's again look at our uh, protocol. So I have the verifier and the notation here is that the verifier's private space is called A. I have the prover, the prover's private space, um, let's call it, it's called B. And then there's a reference as there was before. And let me put, um, okay, I'm not being uh, consistent in my coloring. There's the prover who has space B, and then there's the verifier who has space A, and in the middle we have a reference system, and I'm splitting this reference system into two references, one that I put kind of on the side of the verifier and the other on the side of the, of the prover, but it, it, this is just a matter of notation. Um, then the verifier does their transformation, uh, ship qubits to the prover, the prover does their transformation, ship qubits back to the verifier, and the verifier does their last transformation. So the protocol looks something like this. Okay, so intuitively the definition of verifiability is that whatever the prover does, the verifier should get the correct outcome. And the reason the definition is a little bit subtle is that we have to take into account the fact that the prover can force the verifier to abort. So the verifier should get the correct outcome only when it decides not to reject. Okay, and so this is what this definition, sorry, this is what this definition is saying. It's saying that let's look at an execution of the protocol. So as before, I have an arbitrary input state here for the prover, it's what's called R2B. And then I have an arbitrary input state for the verifier. Well, it's not arbitrary, it's the input state uh, that takes the correct form like this. And I look at um, this state here, that's what is the outcome on the verifier's side. So including any correlation with the reference. So this is this whole AR1 here. The exponent psi is just, it's the output when the input is um, what's, what's written here and what's written here. And so this state as a quantum state should be indistinguishable from a convex combination of two states. So with some probability, I can have a state such that the verifier's private space is just in some big error flag message. And then the reference is just uncorrelated from that. That's with some probability. And then with some other probability, the verifier joint state of the verifier and the reference should be exactly what you would have applied, obtained by applying. So U is this universal circuit that I was talking about before on the verifier space A and then nothing on the reference, okay? Ideally, we would have only the left part. So P psi would be one but that will only be achievable in the case the prover does uh, the right thing. If the prover decides to mess up the protocol, they can force P psi to be um, as close to zero as they want. Okay, and this, this probability in the definition that I'm just giving is allowed to depend on the input state to the protocol. So it could be that the prover makes me accept or reject with different probabilities depending on my uh, input state. Okay, so that's the first definition of verifiability. So this one turns out not to be composable. Um, I chose to put it on the slide because the definition for composability is a little bit more complicated. 
Um, in case anyone's interested, the problem with it is that uh, is exactly in this, in the, in the fact that the probability is allowed to depend on the input state. So you have to allow this probability to depend on the input state uh, because the prover could make you accept or reject with different probabilities depending on that input state. But you have to make sure that this doesn't give them uh, any information about the protocol and about what's what's going on. And so in order to do that, you need to tweak the definition a little bit, but I, 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 I put in the references where you can look it up in, in case you want to look it up, but it was a bit too much to, uh, to write on the slide. Okay, so that's the definition for verifiability. And uh, now how do we achieve it? So the idea is going to use authentication. Um, so we're going to take the protocols that we had before. In the protocol that I had before, my input and all the communication with the prover was encrypted. It was one time padded and this ensured blindness, uh, but it didn't prevent the prover from sending, back, from sending back to me like some totally random qubits, right? I just had to assume at each step that they're sending me back the right qubits and applying the right gates. Um, when in fact, I, I, there was no means in the protocol to verify that they're doing this. They could just send me all the time some zeros or whatever. So the additional idea is that instead of simply encrypting uh, the qubits, we're also going to authenticate them. So here's a definition of a quantum authentication scheme. Uh, then I'll show you how to use the definition to get a verifiable protocol. And I'll conclude by uh, giving you a particular quantum authentication scheme. So here's the definition. So this quantum authentication scheme uh, authenticates L qubits and it's going to authenticate them into L plus E qubits. So the extra E qubits are there to get the security. You can think that L is just one. Uh, in fact, later we're going to authenticate the qubits just one at a time. And then there's a target uh, security uh, epsilon. The authentication scheme is specified by two families of unitaries. So there's the encoding unitaries and there's the decoding uh, unitaries. And each of them is parameterized by a set of, of classical keys, uh, K. And so we want two properties to hold. Uh, first of all, completeness. So completeness states that if I take any state Psi and I add uh, zero E ancilla qubits initialized to zero, then I encode. So I apply my encoding unitary for any key. And then I decode right away, apply the decoding unitary for any key. Then I get back exactly the, the input, okay? Um, that's a natural property. And then soundness. So soundness is a little bit more tricky to formalize. So soundness, we want to say that um, if I give someone my authenticated qubit and then they do whatever they want and they return it back to me, when I decode, I'm either going to get back the original qubit or I, I'll notice that something uh, happened to it. This is what this projection uh, is doing for us. So this is a projection. You can think of it as a measurement operator and it's a projection on good events. So it projects on the state of your qubits being either the correct state, tensor with anything on the ancillas, ancillas don't really matter, we throw them away, or this is a projection orthogonal to the correct state, so anything else, tensored with also anything else on the qubits, okay? So this is saying that either I'm going to notice that the qubits are not zeros, and in that case, the state should not, sorry, in that case, it doesn't matter what the state is, or um, the state is, is what it was. So let me look at the definition. So we do as before, we take the original uh, state Psi, we add some zero and Silas, and then we encode it. And here for soundness, I am encoding using a uniformly random key. Okay, so I chose a key uniformly at random and I applied the encoding unitary. Then I give this to the adversary. The adversary applies any quantum map. So that's a quantum map of the kind that we described before. It can create its own ancillas, apply a big unitary, trace out some things, it returns to us the same number of qubits that we sent to it. So that's L plus E, uh, because otherwise we reject, by the way. And then we decode, okay? And the requirement is that the state that we obtain after this encoding and decoding, in general, it's going to be a mixed state. It should have high overlap on the good subspace, which means that it should uh, decompose as a convex combination of either the original state with whatever on the ancillas or something orthogonal to the original state, but then the ancillas should also have been changed. And so I'm going to be able to notice that by just measuring the ancillas in the computational basis and checking that they're all zeros. So once again, just as a comment, this is a, a standalone definition, uh, but it, you can show that it's, uh, it's, it's also a composable definition. So it's the right definition for, for authentication. Okay, so let me um, explain how authentication would be used. And so I'm not going to write too much here because it gets, it gets a little bit uh, technical to do the details, but the uh, um, high level overview is, is very simple. So 
We can start with the child's protocol, the one I gave you before. And instead of just doing one-time pad, we add authentication. So you can show that this provides, and by child's protocol, I mean really the first one that we used uh, where the, the prover is, is uh, simply a memory. So this provides verifiability. Uh, the reason is that it, the prover is just a, it's just a memory. So I, it keeps my authenticated qubits. Every time I uh, request them back, I'm gonna undo the authentication, verify that it's the correct qubit, apply the gate, redo the authentication, send it back. Okay. Um, but now the problem is that uh, because I have to handle all these uh, ancilla qubits for the authentication, the authentication codes I'm going to show you uses a number of ancilla qubits that scales like log one over epsilon, uh, where epsilon is the security that you want. So the size of the verifier's computer has, has increased a little bit. Moreover, they need to do more complicated operations. They need to undo uh, this authentication, redo it, and, and also on top of that, apply the gates as it did before. Because then the question is, well, but can we do the same tricks as we did before, like kind of delegate the gates to the, to the prover? The problem is that uh, the authentication code now is more complicated than the one-time pad. It's not only just Pauli's, and so the set of operations that are going to commute uh, with your authentication code is, is smaller. So the authentication code that I'm going to describe next is based on applying random Clifford gates, uh, and that allows transversal application of Pauli gates. So the Pauli gates, the server will still be able to do by themselves, but anything else uh, they won't anymore. So now there's a sequence of tricks that I'm not going to go over in any detail that allow um, to recover the same kind of protocol that we had before. One trick that you can do if you want still the server to be able to apply Clifford gates by themselves is use a different authentication code. It's called polynomial code authentication and I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Another trick that I wanted to highlight, um, not so much for how it's used here because it's more complicated than I'm describing on the slide, but um, because it's a useful trick in delegation in general, it's the idea of um, magic states. So this what's described on this figure here is a little protocol where uh, you put the prover at the top and the verifier at the bottom and the outcome of this protocol is that the prover will have been able to apply a T gate uh, on the one-time pad. And there's only classical communication between the two of them. So it's a different way uh, to do what I, what I showed you before where there were two rounds of interaction, but this way is a little bit more efficient. And also it generalizes to authentication even though I'm not, I'm not describing that um, on the slide. And the idea of a magic state is that the magic state is like, it's this state here. So it's a plus state to which I apply the T gate already, and then I apply some randomizations on top of it. Okay, so it's a single qubit state, it's one time padded, I send it to the prover, and then the prover is going to teleport its state here, that's the one time padded state of the computation, inside that state, and in particular, under the T gate. So what the prover does is it applies a C naught, and then it measures the qubit to get an outcome uh, C. The outcome of this, if you work out the circuit, is that the prover has exactly the state T psi with a new one time pad on it. The only problem is that as before, there might be a P gate, a P correction that needs to be applied. Whether this correction needs to be applied or not is the, the string X here. This string X depends on a lot of the keys that the verifier has been keeping to themselves and it can tell the prover whether to apply uh, the gate or not directly. So here you can check that if um, D, E, Y, these three keys are uniformly random, then X is also going to be uniformly random. So it's not, you're not leaking any information by giving it to the, to the prover. Okay. So it's a bit too much to see how this uh, fits in the, the delegation protocol, but the only thing that I want to highlight is this idea that um, there's a way to apply a certain gate, okay, a T gate on a one-time padded state that the prover holds without the prover ever applying uh, the T gate, but instead the verifier sending what's called a magic state. So it's another state to which the T gate has already been applied. And then using ideas similar to teleportation, this state Psi is moved under the, under the, under the T gate that was applied to the state sent by the verifier. Okay? That's the idea of computation using magic states. You're putting the complicated gate directly inside the state. And then what the prover is doing are only simpler gates because C naught and the P, they're simpler gates than the, than the T gate. Okay, so combining all these ideas together, um, these are protocols from 2008 and then some updated versions uh, more recently, you can get protocols that are, a, in fact, they're not epsilon blind, they're perfectly blind and they're epsilon verifiable. Um, 
And you need these extra ancilla qubits at the verifier for the authentication. So the first step, instead of sending the one-time padded uh, bits, you'll send um, authenticated qubits to the, to the prover. And this authentication is going to require you to have a, a log one over epsilon um, computer. And then after that, there's only classical communication. So it's one-way quantum communication at the first step. There's another sequence of protocols that I just wanted to mention, but that I'm not going to go uh, into because they require a little bit uh, too much background. Uh, they're very different. So they use a different model of quantum computing, uh, which is not the circuit model. Uh, it's called the measurement-based model. This is an equivalent model, so both of them are, are universal. But the measurement model seems particularly well-suited to delegation uh, because it works in the following way. Um, the way you execute a measurement-based computation is that, that the first step, you prepare a single, very complicated quantum state, very large. It's as large as the volume of the circuit, so depth times width. Uh, but it doesn't depend on the circuit. It just depends on the size. Okay, So it's this like big entangled state that you kind of lay out in front of you, and you can tell the prover to do that. And once you've done that, uh, you've already done most of the work. The rest of the quantum computation is implemented by making single qubit measurements in an adaptive manner. So you take the first qubit. You measure it, you get an outcome. And based on that and the circuit you're interested in, you compute a way to measure the second qubit. You do it, you get an outcome. You compute a way to measure the third qubit, and you just do that. Okay. And so because these are just adaptive single qubit measurements, it's not trivial, but there's a way for the, ver the, the verifier to, to drive this measurement process at the prover in a way that's blind, that's not too hard, and verifiable, you can, you can also do it. So I just wanted to mention that because it's uh, one of the interesting things in, in, in this problem of delegating quantum computation is that there's, there's many uh, universal models of quantum computing. It's much richer than the models that we have for classical computation and different models like this lend themselves more or less well to delegation of computation. We'll see another such model in the, in the last lecture. Um, any questions? So in the, I have 10 more minutes. I just want to describe to you this Clifford authentication scheme and that, that'll be the last thing. So there's a question you can interrupt otherwise. Yes, there's a question in the chat about the definition of soundness. So okay. the definition, the, the question is, how does the decryption unitary work if, S, if F is not unitary and increase decreases the dimension of the state? Ah, yeah, I said this a little bit too fast. So you're right. In general, the adversaries map could um, add qubits or throw away all the qubits. But if you think of the authentication scheme itself, it authenticated L qubits into L plus E, then it put those into some untrusted memory, and then it's going to receive some qubits back and uh, deauthenticate them, check them. Now, if the number of qubits that I receive back is not what I expect, then I'll just stop right away. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say this, this, this doesn't work, it's an error. So here I could have written in the, in the definition that the decryption map um, first checks that you have the right number of qubits. If you don't, then you report an error. And if you do have the right number of qubits, then you apply the decryption unitary. I continue. Okay, so let's continue by seeing, let's finish by seeing a nice, uh, very simple um, authentication scheme. So it's called Clifford authentication scheme. So we're going to use the key to specify a Clifford circuit, an arbitrary Clifford circuit on E plus one qubits. Aha, so here, sorry, I forgot my notation. I'm choosing L to be one. So authenticate. L equals one qubits. Okay, how are you going to do that? So you choose a random or arbitrary Clifford circuit on E plus one qubits. So for this, you have to make sure that you have a way to efficiently generate uh, an arbitrary uh, Clifford circuit, and you can do that. So the number of Clifford circuits on E plus one qubits, this is something like two to the uh, E squared. Okay, so in order to specify one such circuit, you need E squared bits of key. So the key length scales quadratically with your security parameter uh, in this scheme. And then encryption and decryption are easy. They're the same, so they're inverse of each other. And you just apply uh, the circuit, the Clifford circuit that you chose directly on the qubit you want to authenticate and your E ancilla qubits. Um, so, Completeness for the scheme is clear because they're the same unitary transformations and so they're self-inverse uh, to each other. Uh, 
And now let me tell you a little bit about uh, Sonos to show that uh, this is a correct authentication scheme. There's, there's two steps. First, I want to tell you about the clock poly twirl, and then I'll tell you about something a little bit more advanced that's called uh, the Clifford twirl. So the poly twirl is just a, you can think of it as a very useful calculation. Uh, you can use it to prove security of the quantum one-time pad. So it says that if you take any quantum state on certain number of qubits, so there's m qubits on which I act, and these are just uh, ancilla or, or reference qubits. And then what's happening to this poly is that I'm applying to this density matrix is that I'm applying two polys, P prime and P on the left and on the right, but these polys got conjugated by a random poly Q. So it's the same Q everywhere, but P and P prime are different. And the calculation says that uh, this expression is zero. I'm gonna show you how it's used later. Uh, how do you prove such a thing? The polys, they can be parameterized, and this is a useful parameterization as any poly is just a bunch of Xs followed by a bunch of uh, Zs up to a phase. Uh, but putting a phase in this expression is not gonna make any difference, so I can ignore it. So I can, without loss of generality, assume that P is X to the A, Z to the B. If it's a multi-qubit poly, this A is a string and this B is a string, and these are tensor products of polys. P prime, I can write as, um, sorry, X to the A prime, Z to the B prime. And finally, Q, I can also parameterize it as x, c, z, d. And now I can easily make the calculation for what the terms in the expression are, q dagger uh, p prime q. I know the commutation rule or anti-commutation rule between uh, the Paulis. So this is going to be equal to, let's keep the q dagger outside and let's commute the p prime uh, with the q. So I will get q and p prime. And I'm going to pick up a phase um, that's there when Okay, so what phase should I get when the z's commute with each other? So I think I should get c times b prime. And then the two q's cancel each other, except um, due to the, oh, they just cancel to each other. So I would just get p prime minus one c to the b prime. And similarly, q dagger p q, this is going to be equal to p minus one, um, I think I did something wrong in the calculation. Mm. Yeah. I got the phase wrong. And then here there's something similar, uh, except it's A and B, so C, B plus A, D, okay? And so now if you look, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing the whole calculation is something that's better to do for yourself. If you average over all Qs, you're averaging over all Cs and Ds, and these two phase, the only way that you're going to get something non-zero is if the um, B prime is equal to B and A prime is equal to A, which means that P should be equal to P prime. If they're different, uh, you get zero. Okay, this calculation, uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is that it has a useful uh, consequence. So I just reproduced the same calculation uh, here. It's the same that was written before. Now let's look at an arbitrary map. I'm going not to, you could do what I'll do for arbitrary maps, but for simplicity, let me just consider an attack that would conjugate by unitary. Okay, I'm setting aside adding ancillas, removing ancillas. So unitaries in general, I can decompose them as a linear combination of polys. And this is just because the Pauli matrices are basis for the set of all matrices uh, as a vector space over the complex numbers. So now let's apply this map to a one-time padded state Ho. So then in that case, what I would get is I can expand. Uh, so I have the one-time pad. So I would have this one over four to the M sum over Q in PM. That's my one-time pad. And then I apply the map U. So I can decompose, I get P and P prime, alpha P, alpha P prime, and then Okay, so this is the result of applying, okay, what I wrote here is, I don't have a very succinct way of writing it, but it's like, if I applied the one-time pad to Ho, and then I applied the map F, and then I undid the one-time pad, what would I get? Okay, so the one-time pad are the Qs, and then the map F, which is just an arbitrary unitary, I decomposed as a linear combination of the Paulis. Okay, so using the calculation that we have above, 
all the cross terms cancel. And so what I get is I get one over four to the M, the sum over all Qs, the sum over all P of alpha P squared, Q dagger PQ, which I could compute what it is. Okay. What's important to see here beyond the calculation is that what conjugating by the one time pad did to my arbitrary unitary is that I transformed this, I, it transformed this arbitrary unitary into a mixture, okay? So this is just a convex combination. The sum of alpha p squared is equal to one. This follows from the fact that u is unitary. It's a mixture of, this is just a poly and this is just a poly, okay? So you took an arbitrary unitary conjugated by the one time pad and now it becomes a non-uniform mixture of polys. And in general, if you can assume that your adversary applies only poly unitaries, this is going to be easier for you to analyze them because you know exactly how these polys behave uh, on your data. What the poly 12 does is that if you, if an arbitrary adversary is acting on top of a one-time pad, then in fact it decomposes as a mixture of poly attacks, uh, poly adversaries, which are easier to analyze. Okay, so this is what I wrote here. Now, I think I'm going to skip that, uh, the proof of that lemma in the, in the interest of time because we only have a few minutes, but the, you can prove a similar lemma with Clifford Gates. And it's going to tell you that on top of now, not a random poly, but a random Clifford, the result is going to be not only that it reduces to a mixture of poly attacks, but moreover, and more importantly, this mixture is going to be uniform. So in the case of the Clifford, if, if I had here Cliffords, so I just take a random Clifford on M qubits, I have Clifford on random qubits, then this here, I'd get virtually the same result. It's what's written on the next slide. But this distribution here would be, again, uh, it would just be the uniform distribution. The reason for that is that um, Cliffords makes the polys around, okay? Cliffords conjugate polys to polys, and moreover, for any pair of polys, there's exactly the same number of Cliffords non-identity polys, there's exactly the same number of Cliffords that map them to one another. Okay, so this is very powerful because it says that any attack on top of a random Clifford circuit is mapped to a uniform combination of polys. And if you go back to the authentication now, uh, think about an adversary trying to apply an arbitrary attack on top of my Clifford. Whatever they do, because of the random Clifford, this attack is going to be mapped to a uniformly random poly but my authenticated state had one qubit of the real state and then all these zeros. If I'm forced to apply uniformly random Pauli to this, what's gonna happen, I am going to flip, except with exponentially small probability, I am going to flip some of the ancillas and this is going to be noticed. And there's nothing I can do, nothing else I can do. Any CPTP map by the adversary has to be just act as a uniformly random Pauli on the unauthenticated un un uh, data. And so that's what allows you to sh show that it's, that it's caught and that this Clifford scheme has security um, something like three quarters to the to the number of uh, to the number of ancillary qubits. So that's what's going on here. But I'll skip it and and conclude so that we we finish on time. Um, so I the main idea for this lecture was the idea of uh, computing on encrypted data, which allows you to do uh, delegation uh, with a quantum server. There is little overhead at the server, and the verifier is fairly simple, except it still needs a constant size uh, quantum computer. Uh, we achieved perfect uh, blindness and um, verifiability. Uh, this U, there's a little blow up in the size of the verifier's computer, depending on uh, how small the epsilon that you want to be. And then I discussed very briefly uh, additional models. There's a few open questions here. Maybe I want to highlight just the first one um, because it's a very subtle question. Um, it's a question whether, but it's, it's a relevant question because these there's actually experiments uh, for these protocols, like very simple experiments where the verifier has just one qubit, the prover has maybe three qubits and you do a little bit of a protocol like this. And of course, these days with experiments, uh, there's a lot of errors in them. Uh, so there's a, a practical, but also it's a very interesting theoretical question of whether you can make the protocols fault tolerant. So I can always say that the prover has a fault tolerant quantum computer, that, that's fine. Um, but the verifier has a very small quantum computer. And if you look into it, it's, you have to be very careful. Okay, well, there's going to be errors um, at the verifier's computer and who's going to co correct these errors? Like who performs the error correction? 
if the verifier does the whole error correction, then they, they need a big computer. They're doing all this error correction. Um, but if the prover is required to apply the error correction, then you have to be very careful how this is going to be checked and whether any errors, that legitimate errors, because you're doing error correction, you expect legitimate errors that apply at the prover, how these are going to uh, be related to the verifier's keys and the, uh, the one-time pad and the authentication, and if there's not any bias that can be introduced in this way. So it's actually an open question to make these protocols fault tolerant in a satisfactory way. Okay, these are other um, open questions. Well, let me stop here because we're out of time. And um, in the second hour, I'll talk about uh, classical verifiers and, and two quantum servers.